Our presenters for today are Mr. Steve Hobrexi, who is the founding partner and CEO of TPA Global, Ms. Avisha Sood, and myself, Anusha. So firstly, we will discuss CFO's objectives. As you are all aware, post death there is an increasing pressure on the CFOs to streamline their intra-group services to, in order to ensure that the finance setup is more lean and mean. So my colleague, Avisha, will take you through the various CFOs' objectives in this slide. Next, we will discuss the conceptual framework around, around streamlining intra-group services, where we will discuss various cost definitions, that is actual cost versus budgeted costs, etc. Following this, we will discuss the practical application and process mapping on service catalog. I now hand over the presentation to my colleague, Avisha. Thanks, Anisha. And to start with, we will start with outlining some of the objectives we have noticed in our conversations with CFOs of multinational companies as to what they want to achieve with intra-group services cost. So first, and foremost objective has been communicated as reduction of the number of intercompany invoices. By this we mean that if there are far, if there are 50 different entities, they should not all be invoicing each other or all the service recipients. It should be, uh, the number of invoices should be reduced by making one entity or two entities as the lead service provider through which all invoices should be routed to all service recipients. Another key objective would be to have standardized costs captured in each invoice. So uh, if there are five entities involved in provision of legal services and they're all le left responsible for making their own invoices, you can never be sure as to whether all of the same categories of costs are captured in each of the invoices prepared. Since this was one of the practical challenges brought forward to us, we will go over it in this webinar as to how to overcome some of these. Another, um, reason, another reason for standardizing, standardization of uh, intergroup services costs is also from a risk management perspective. Because if you have each different entities charging each other at all times, and there is no consistency in the invoice so that is being charged by one entity to the other, you're more likely to face challenges from uh, the side of the service recipient, from the tax authorities of the country of the service recipient, from accepting the benefit of that service and therefore the invoice to that service recipient in such country. Whereas if you were to have standardized invoices with standardized um, levels of information per invoice, and if most one, two, or three countries accept it, then it also becomes easier for you to use that as a basis to explain it to the tax authorities of the next country. And last but not the least, one of the most important objectives these days, especially keeping in mind all sorts of uh, digitalized reporting that multinational enterprises need to do, to have this process automated as well, to reduce as many inconsistencies as possible. With this, just one uh, one comment, uh, Avisha. Uh, this is Dave. Um, just to put things in, into the broader perspective, uh, if you have an OPEX of uh, 1,000 and you're centralized, uh, your cost relating to centralized services and centralized services could take the shape of headquarters, shared service centers, or uh, business unit uh, centralized services. Um, the, the relative statement of if you have 1,000 of OPEX of the group as a whole and only one of that 1,000 is uh, labeled centralized services, you seem to have a very decentralized organization. On the other side, if you have of the 1,000 OPEX the whole organization carries, you have uh, say 400 of that 1,000 is relating to centralized services, uh, that could be uh, a fairly centralized model in place. So also uh, knowing that type of numbers and not just in isolation, the, the one or the 400 number and applying a spreadsheet uh, wizard to it um, makes sense because you, you need to understand the context in which these charges are um, are 
uh, charged out and received by the uh, the, uh, the beneficiaries um, in terms of what business model is this company running. Um, I think a lot of companies do charge um, the these costs in isolation, looking at the spreadsheet, but not necessarily looking at the business model in which these charge outs take place. And, and this first slide that Visha was uh, was addressing is, is is not so much a tax driven um, slide as well as uh, CFO's um, hunger for streamlining an efficient uh, workflow um, in, in in finance and and maybe as a as a side shoot get a defendable tax position. So even uh, where we believe these service charges are typically tax driven and in, in this uh, particular case uh, are we, we having quite a few CFOs which have overarching uh, objectives on, on doing uh, this type of exercise. So, Lucia? Okay, thanks uh, for the explanation. Actually, Steph, the next slide is for you okay. to carry well, on. Okay, <laughs> you turn. So, so w one of the things I was telling, um, it, it, are we looking at services versus operational cost? Uh, what, what I mean with that is, um, if the headquarters is involved in just supporting the operations as a staff functionality, it typically is uh, reflected as a cost plus mechanism because that cost plus mechanism uh, reflects the staff and thus the support nature, uh, call it cost center nature of, of that service being provided. Uh, the minute the CFO or as or CEO starts start uh, being involved uh, as part of the headquarters in in day to day deal deal making, then uh, obviously the deal making becomes um, a, a, an act of a profit center, and and then suddenly uh, the discussion we had with uh, with tax authorities is okay, but then maybe cost plus is not the right. Compensation. Maybe it should be a cost plus a percentage of revenue or profit uh, made by by the group companies the the CEO and the CFO are supporting. So it's very important to understand the nature of the activities of the of the board members in a in a headquarter uh, being staff versus line functionality. Uh, so so that's one one point of attention. The other is is are, are we talking direct cost only, or, or should we include indirect cost? And, and what, in this particular case, if we calculate the daily rate for a service engineer, um, say service engineer makes 40,000 40, a year, um, uh, runs uh, uh, in total max 1,600 uh, hours they can work on, on a client, um, and in this case, the, the service engineer is not utilized 25%. How do you then calculate the daily rate? And, and do you uplift that daily rate where you try to weave in the anticipated uh, underutilization uh, means it increases your daily rate uh, with, with an uplift, with a profit uplift? Is, is a profit uplift for 5% for enough? Uh, or if you talk about the service engineer, are you talking more about an operational uplift of, say, seven and a half to ten percent? Plus, if you've done that calculation, is there not a local service engineer in the local market with, with an equivalent rate you can use to actually price your intercompany service engineers working in Holland and uh, uh, being sent out? to support uh, the German operations just in uh, in case that happens. Uh, so the direct indirect cost is a good starting point but but don't forget to to do the measurement uh, with uh, with comparable uh, information in the in the marketplace. Um, last point here is uh, whether you could apply marginal costing. So there are situations where um, the capacity of say again that same pool of service engineers is not fully utilized uh, simply because uh, they're 
their pool of uh, service engineers um, is competing with uh, cheaper service engineers being third parties. Uh, so it's easier for, say, the Norwegian group company to uh, hire a local third party at 30, uh, 30 euros an hour rather than pooling a service engineer from the Dutch service pool within the group, which costs 45. And then obviously it's cheaper and more beneficial for the bonus of the Norwegian managing director to just pull in uh, the, the local um, um, third party independent service engineers. Uh, in that type of discussions, you can imagine the CFO takes drastic measures and wants to increase the utilization rate of the whole pool of service engineer available. I mean that this is part of an APA discussion I have. Uh, marginal costing comes to the play. So maybe just using direct cost will make that service engineer from the pool 30 euros as well, and thereby uh, it, it's for the group as a whole better to use people from the pool than the Norwegian guy pulling in someone from uh, from the marketplace. So so this is uh, based on on a couple of real cases. So it's not always full costing. That's the message. Um, so the next slide is, is a little bit about uh, actual cost and budgeted cost. Uh, the, the, the question is, do you want to keep the service provider accountable for staying within budget? So if, if everyone agrees the, the IT department uh, has a budget of uh, 1,000, and at the end of the year they just bought a couple of servers and they, they spend a lot of money on, on their hobbies and suddenly their cost is 2,000. Who is accountable for that? So my question always in the, in the light of um, a, a cost center typically should have someone who is accountable for those costs and especially the relationship between budget and actual. I'll always ask whether who is accountable for the headquarters uh, to stay within budget for the shared service centers and for the BU. If I don't get a clear answer, I might as well just immediately go to the actual cost because currently there's not a lot of measurement of how efficient the service provider and provision is being measured on or even being controlled. And sometimes that's even uh, leading to very dangerous situations. Uh, uh, one one example uh, where IT costs uh, per workplace were approaching 10,000 uh, euros uh, leads to excessive charges, and, and as we all know, uh, 10,000 euros per uh, of IT charges per workplace uh, really makes you feel there's a lot of hobbies in the IT department uh, to uh, to thrive on and not anyone accountable to stay and keep the IT costs within budget. Uh, so that's an important question on the actual versus budget. The, the question on how to apply the benefit test, and, and again, I think the benefit test should be 90% of, uh, of your time spent on, on files like this uh, rather than getting blinded by the light in, in terms of uh, being busy too too long with uh, Excel spreadsheets uh, to, to get the numbers right. Uh, this example is on a global contract department. So how do you measure the ultimate benefit? Is it uh, the uh, number of commercial contracts this legal department has reviewed for the Italian subsidiary as a percentage of the total reviewed number of uh, commercial contracts? Or is it really just a, a, a standby fee. Uh, you have a hundred of costs of the legal department uh, who refuse these contracts and there's 10 entities and they, they all get one tenth of the cost. Uh, those are two ways to um, to look at a benefit test uh, where the, the uh, standby fees uh, would, would be a good replacement of uh, the very volatile number of commercial contracts reviewed for you type of uh, variable. Again, uh, here the, the, the difference between staff and line, if, if uh, 
roughly said if the local entity receiving uh, the services from the center is having an, uh, an operational expense of 100 and gets 100 or more of imported OPEX through the service charges from other group companies, then your transfer pricing system might not be adequately supporting the business, the, the, the fairly centralized business model anymore. And you might need to rethink whether a charge out mechanism is, is really the way to go because the more, uh, the minute you, you start charging 50% of the OPEX into a country, there will be a lot of uh, resistance by the local tax inspector to, and a lot of arguments to say uh, there's no benefit for, for these charges and, and, and they're probably right as well. Okay, that's a little bit on the conceptual framework. Um, some some practical uh, allocation, uh, and here is the, the question on uh, on infrastructure and capacity. We addressed that a little bit in the the service engineering pool, and we the big question here is who is best placed to bear the service capacity risk. Um, I think a lot of people believe, and tax authorities in, in particular, that uh, all costs always should be charged out, irrespective of how efficient uh, the capacity of the risk uh, of the service provider is being managed. Um, and I tend to disagree. I, I think there's a few examples where an expense center, and, and, and to, to go back to the theory, an expense center is like, uh, if you have an R&D hub which acts as an, uh, as an expense center, it will charge all its costs to the principal who uh, is financing it and, and probably in that case managing the dumping functions. Uh, in case you, you have a service provider, you always want to get a traction of the budgeted cost and stay fairly close to it. And if there's a deviation of more than 10%, like in a third party situation, you would start arguing about the level of the cost. So that's uh, what I want to address here. Again, it's coming back on the governance on the, on, on the centralized cost uh, budget versus actuals. Um, the ratio imported OPEX and total OPEX I just addressed with that 50% imported OPEX where probably your transfer pricing system is not aligned with your business model anymore. Very good. Um, Avisha? Okay. Uh, so now break down, uh, to put it in a little bit simplistic model, as you can see on the slide, to make a flowchart out of how do you determine what are the steps rather in identifying the total costs that are incurred in provision of service to how much of that can be charged out to each service recipient. So, yeah, and obvious first step is our service, if the services are not rendered, there's no cost allocation possible. So at first, if we are doing this for one year, so in that one year, ask any services provided. So if there are services provided, then start with the total cost of everyone involved in providing that service. From that, so that could be easily coming out of the OPEX of the entity where such people who are involved in providing the services are located. So that should be step number one, starting point. From that, yes, yeah, subtract extraordinary costs. That is, if it is uh, either a one-time fee that is incurred. So in order, this is decision tree is for something that can be standardized and therefore automated. So therefore, if there are some extraordinary costs that are either coming in as a one-off basis or it was a need that arose only in that particular year, such things should be eliminated from that total cost base that we identified in step one. Let me give one example. Uh, one of the headquarters I was dealing with had 200 people on the payroll, but they only, uh, after the crisis, were really delivering uh, 100 persons show of services. So the 100 persons were laid off, and then the question was, what to do with their with their redundancy thing. Uh, is that really benefiting uh, the recipients that uh, the service provider was 
uh, uh, making its capacity fit for purpose huh, after the crisis? Uh, probably not in that particular case, but that's a, that's an example of extraordinary costs to subtract. Actually, that's a little bit related to the point you were making just earlier about who should bear the risk of uh, lack of serv uh, MP service capacity. capacity. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So these extraordinary costs are always a struggle. So since we are trying to determine what are the standard items that can really automatically be put into a software, so a different mechanism can be used for recharging extraordinary costs. So take them out of the total pool. Then moving on, uh, allocate overhead costs. Right, so we started with step number one, where we took total cost of all employees involved in providing the service. This should also be looked at in the proportion of their time. And in the same proportion, the uh, overheads of the entities where they are located should be allocated, should be added to that total cost minus extraordinary cost. Then as per, as all of you may already know, the shareholder cost as per OCD and other uh, uh, definitions provided by other international organizations such as UN, EU, JDPF, you need to remove shareholder costs from this pool as well, because shareholder costs cannot be recharged to each and every service recipient within your group company. At this point, you will be left with all the costs that can actually be charged out to each service recipient. Now, so for some costs, there's a direct service recipient because probably in that year, there was only one or two people that required the services of, let's say, the HR department because there were only two, two entities that hired anyone in that year. So that's an easy direct recharge. Uh, then what we mean by indirect recharge is when you have to use allocation keys to determine if, for example, legal services, including review of legal contracts and such, were provided by one entity to five, so five different group entities. In such case, an allocation key needs to be decided as to how to distribute the costs incurred over the year in provision of such legal services over all of the service recipients. Just, uh, just a point on shareholders' costs. I know there's a lot of debate on that. Uh, the, if, you, if you're uh, privately held, uh, I always say take the cost of the CEO and the CFO or maybe a portion of COO's cost, and you will certainly not exceed $250,000 or euros as shareholders' costs. If, you, if you're a stock quota company, um, I, I have a list of six, I have a 16 pages list of shareholders cost I can really stretch it to the max if I take then the centralized costs say are 1000 then I can stretch probably shareholders definition to uh, in a normal case to up to 10 percent but I know companies who uh, who really um, uh, were creative with the 16 pages and, and stretched that up to 30% of these 1,000 centralized costs were presented as shareholders' costs, and uh, for that matter, probably for the with the right arguments behind it. Uh, but in in normal situations, I would say 10% of shareholders' cost of the total 1,000 centralized pooled cost is is sort of a natural um, natural threshold to to think about. Okay, so what you see on the slides next is a model we have commonly suggested to clients to help streamline where do costs arise, where are service recipients, and what should be the category of the intra-group services. So uh, this is called a three by three by three model because it has three elements, each of which have three variables. So uh, the first one being there are three cat the Group entities need to be divided into three different categories. One is a contract service provider, one is a lead service provider, and another is service recipient. So what's the difference between lead and contract service provider is that it's only the lead service provider and the service recipient that stay in touch with each other. By that, I mean they, uh, it's only the lead service provider that invoices the service recipient. 
And if the service recipient doesn't get the service, it is the risk of the lead service provider to make sure the service reaches the service recipient. However, in all cases, it may not be the lead service provider who's employing people who have the capability to deliver the service, but this role may be contracted to another group entity, which is called the contract service provider. So the contract service provider provides services to the lead service provider. Those services are, the cost of those services are marked up with um, a certain percentage based on a benchmark. Then the lead service provider collects such costs from all contract service providers, pulls them together, and then decides an allocation key based on which to recharge it out to all service recipients. At this stage, the only costs that are marked up are the costs that the lead service provider incurs in collection of costs, in making the invoice, and in sending it out to all service recipients. So the, the uh, uplift, say cost plus five, let's assume full costing, is only happening once at the point where the costs originate, typically in, in case of services where the people are on the payroll. So in this case, contract service provider would mainly be the one whose costs would be uplifted. The second, the second element of the three by three model is it works for three, the, the services that are to be covered could be classified as three types, global headquarter, regional shared service center, and business platform. Global headquarter, as is clear by the name, are the headquarter type services provided by the headquarter entity, like uh, setting strategy, management, uh, global IT, global HR, are part of the global HQ services. The regional shared service center services may have a little bit of overlap in terms of functional classification. So an HR service might also be global, but also regional. Whereas the difference would be that at a global level, the people are involved in preparation of a strategy and how it applies for the whole group. Whereas at a regional level, it may be implementation of that strategy for that region. Uh, that leaves business platform services. Business platform services are the key operational services uh, needed for running the business. So uh, business platform services are a little bit different than the global headquarter and regional shared service center, because it would be, let's say you have a, an operational team within a multinational company comprised of entities in different regions. So that should have one business platform head that is responsible for collecting all services that are needed for to be provided to the cluster of entities that form that team or that, is, that are part of that business platform. But let's give an example. If we, I, I don't Not know the, the, the very details, but let's take Unilever has one or two headquarters, as we know this London and, and, and Rotterdam as, uh, as global headquarters, uh, and maybe uh, soon uh, uh, only one, one location. Then shared service centers, they might have three regional shared service centers to cover the three regions in, in, in the three regions as defined in, in terms of time zones. And they have probably three, four business units uh, and, and, and maybe even more. So that sort of gives you this, um, this uh, three-dimensional um, uh, categorization of centralized services. Not each company has the same allocation and categorization. Uh, so in some cases, HR will be global headquarters, in some cases, uh, multinationals will say, well, HR is really the support at, at the level of shared service centers. And yes, we make a policy in the global headquarters, but there's only one person there who, who defines the policy. So that is multinational um, specific definitions uh, or, or categorization, uh, and there's no cookie cutter at, at, at this level. Right, that leaves our third element in the three by three model, which is the easiest. Uh, the entities need to be classified in three regions. Uh, you could define regions could be defined different for different organizations, but for sake of simplicity on this slide, you see America's AMEA and Asia Pacific. 
but regions could be regions could be divided as a group of entities uh, located in part of let's say northern europe or certain group entities could be clustered together because uh, they are responsible for serving a certain set of clients in that region so it doesn't have to be as strictly followed as only americas emea and asia pacific but regional could be classified regions could be classified based on the cases of the multinational group entity uh, multinational group itself so this is a model we and, and 10 years ago we we started standardizing the three times three times three model uh, we applied it on a few stockholder companies in the americas uh, who've been running uh, a cost plus five model where the five only occurred when the costs uh, were originating in that location uh, and by standardizing this model uh, we were able and that's the phase we're in now to start automating the structure um, especially all the uh, all the variables around the famous uh, sp spreadsheet wizard which I'm sure a lot of you recognize uh, so so that's why we believe three times three times three model uh, is one way of standardization and certainly has helped us in the, in the, in the cases we are working on and have worked on to uh, to get the automation started of, uh, on, on this process. With this, we move on to a little practical example on what how to build a service catalog. Uh, Steve, maybe you want to provide the introduction to this, and then we carry on. Yeah, this, this is, uh, at the end of the day, you only get a deduction on service charges if you can prove to the Italian tax authorities there's a benefit. Uh, I'm taking an obvious uh, um, uh, case. So the benefit test is, it's almost like reverse engineering. You you need the benefit test, and what do you need to, to uh, create an auto trail and approve around that benefit test? Uh, that starts with the service catalog, which defines what services are covered, uh, what cost levels, what allocation keys, how do you collect costs, how do you distribute costs with or without an uplift. That means one step back, I'm, I'm working the, the spreadsheet, uh, the, the, the slide in front of you from the right to the left. Uh, then I, I need, in, in the reverse, I need to define standard cost per service if I want to produce a price list and, and then I still have the option obviously to use standardized cost uh, in the budgeting process and in the quarterly or monthly charges and I can still at, at the year end do a tour up to actuals. That means those standardized costs need to come from cost codes and indirect cost codes um, which which are in your general ledger um, in, in your uh, SAP system, uh, Oracle, uh, even Hyperion uh, cost centers definitions. Uh, that that means you need to understand where those costs come from. Uh, that the, here is the example. If you see IT costs being nine and a half thousand dollars per workplace, uh, would you be able to defend that position towards the Italian tax authorities if you know? Well, a normal workplace and IT support, if you're a regular company, probably is between $1,000 and maybe $2,000 per workplace. Then, uh, obviously, there's some hidden IT costs which were not that efficiently spent. Maybe your IT department built a few platforms which were all not all that successful, but still they, they put it in the big box called IT service, IT costs. With services to uh, with attached to services to be on charge, so there's also a, a need for tax people to understand whether the level of cost you're looking at is reasonable compared to the marketplace. So you can't simply rely on uh, someone junior in finance has collected some cost and has done some magic to it, and therefore nine and a half thousand is the right number because it probably and I, I can assure you in this case, it's certainly not the right number, and certainly the Italian tax authority is going, is going to be pushing back on the deductibility. Then you need to uh, work it back to the departments, which, which are the, the uh, activity which generate these costs. So what I've done in the introduction, I work, work my way back. Again, 
uh, service catalog is important, but benefit test is even more important. So now I'll take you to the various stages of how to build a service catalog. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to identify various service departments and also the relevant FTs which are involved in providing a particular service. At one of the services as described by Avisha previously under the three by three by three models, that is the global headquarters services, the global business platform services, and the regional shared service center services. So now, how do you proceed with identifying the service departments and the FTEs? The first thing you can do is you can determine the total OPEX of the group. Then you can identify which are the service departments which are contributing to this total OPEX, only keeping in mind the three services previously defined in the 3 by 3 by 3 model. Then you identify the relevant FTEs which are involved in the provision of each of the, these three types of services. And, class, and also at the same time, also identify third party or external service providers involved in provision of the global headquarter, global business platform, and regional shared service center services. So at the end, after you've identified each of the, these categories, what you will have is you will have profit identified per location of the service department. You would have identified various activities, that is, the global headquarter services, the business platform services, and the regional services, you would have identified the number of FTEs which are involved in performing each of these services. And you would have also identified the third party service providers that are engaged in providing this service. Now, after this first step, the next thing that you need to do is you need to identify what are the costs. So for this, as you understand, the state has taken you through previously that there are two cost categories that we can see here. That is the direct cost and the indirect cost. So what are the direct costs? So direct costs can comprise of the personal costs, which include the salary costs, holiday benefits, etc. Plus also the indirect costs that are the costs of uh, IT system costs, travel expenses, rent, electricity, etc which also enable in the provision of a certain service. So the, as you can see, the direct costs are, are the costs which are incurred in the exact like, provision of the service, whereas indirect costs are also involved in the facilitation of the service. So at this stage, a coherent definition has to be provided uh, within the, uh, by the service departments to classify the cost categories. Yeah, one one example here, um, you, you could say we we look at direct cost and indirect cost, uh, which could be in, in in the case direct cost could be salary cost, indirect cost could be the overhead, uh, the the roof, the electricity, the light, uh, facilitating the uh, service provider uh, personnel to to do their job, but you could also look at the Third category, which is maybe big uh, uh, charges by third parties, uh, which which are also injected at the level of uh, of the centralized hub. Uh, so if you have, um, for example, Microsoft sends you an invoice uh, of, of one million euros for the whole group, and it sends that invoice to the headquarters, and the big question is. Do you take that into account and in also uh, as part of your intercompany services? Or can you find uh, better solutions for it if Microsoft, for example, charges directly the beneficiaries um, based on a per seat or per user, concurrent user base? Uh, so that's, that's another discussion ar around cost, direct and indirect cost here means salary related cost mostly yes so while identifying your direct costs indirect costs and any such third party costs as well what uh, ta what has to be done is you have to also ensure that a measurement has to be made with a comparable information in the market base as has also been highlighted by Steve previously now the next step in order to build a service catalog 
is to identify the standard cost per service. So now once you've identified the service departments, you've identified the FTEs which are engaged in providing the three type of services which will be a part of the service catalog. You have also identified the type of cost, direct cost, indirect cost, third party cost. Now what you need to do is you need to you need to identify each cost, standard cost per service. So a correlation at this stage has to be made between the standard cost and the service category. So for this purpose, you can identify various allocation keys in case there are several service recipients of a particular service. And for example, for IT service, you can have a uh, number of users for, or you can have headcount for all other services or you can have revenue. So it depends on the, your organization what you would say would be a uniform allocation key that you can select for the for uh, determining the standard cost per service. So at this stage, you can use various allocation models to identify an attribute cost per type of service. Yeah, and standardized cost uh, uh, could, could be your starting point. Huh? You, 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 the, the service engineer example I gave earlier is a good example, but the, the question here is whether you want to, uh, at the at the end of the day, want to have actual cost charged out or budgeted cost with or without a true up, or you want even flexible costing or pricing to we to be weaved in in terms of the if the quantity goes up the the the, how the service charge goes up if the price of the service goes up during the year also the price of the intercompany services will will have to be um, uh, updated as well. So there's these four techniques, which uh, most of the cases are not that relevant for tax. Um, these days they are because the, the technique which is best reflecting the business rationale will be also the easiest to defend from a tax perspective. What does a service catalog really help you do? It creates definition of various type of services. And as also Steve mentioned previously, it helps to address the delta between the budgeted cost and actual cost, and for you to do a true up at the end of the year to reach the budgeted amount. Now also, what in this regard, what the service catalog also does is address the CFO's one of the main concerns, that is you will have standardized invoices. Instead of having 16 line items per invoice, you will have a standard invoice, which will just be about one service. That is, suppose HR service, IT service, legal service, or a tax service. So what this does at the end of the day is, this reduces various VAT implications for your company. That is, you don't have to pay VAT per service, per invoice category, that is, for each of the 16 lines on your invoice, you do not have to go ahead and determine the VAT treatment. You can avoid that as your, service, as your invoice is now simplified to address just one service type. Well, that's, that, that, you know, that's a good point you raise, uh, Anusha. The, the, the other question is, uh, uh, one example we've been working on recently uh, was, was, say, you have a person on a payroll in France, and the, and the, the pay slip says, uh, these 16 lines with all different, uh, so part is the salary cost, part is the, the company card, the mobile phone, etc. If you put all those lines, line items on the specs of the invoice, um, VAT people will um, will find it very interesting to address the VAT treatment of each line item, uh, whereas maybe that person is just uh, performing legal services and legal services um, it, within the EU gets a certain uh, allocation of where the service is being provided, where the VAT um, the liability arises. So I think that that's that's a, a, an element VAT, but also uh, you can imagine if certain IP-related components are in that slicing, although it's very hard to understand payslip and intangibles, but let's assume that the, the specs of that in the company invoices does raise uh, an item which can be classified as a intercompany services, but 
um, in, in a lot of uh, countries following the UN model uh, do classify under the wider definition of uh, Article 12 royalties, then suddenly withholding taxes uh, is, is creating leakages, and leakages are all, always very annoying for the CFO because he needs to find a financing somewhere else. Uh, so, so the, the less, the more standardization, the it is a balancing act against uh, um, awkward VAT treatment and, and uh, potential withholding tax leakages. At the same time, um, what what I also see happening a lot is that uh, there's not a clear cut standardized grouping of invoices. That means easily. 10 million of internal cost uh, at the point of origination because they get pumped around a couple of times through some awkward waterfall principle uh, could easily land up in being 50, uh, 50 million cost being pumped around with all the VAT and VAT, uh, the VAT and withholding tax consequences leading to a lot of leakages. So this, this three times three times three model is also there to standardize and, and the, the whole treatment, but also certainly we're not forgetting to balancing uh, to, uh, the balancing off against the uh, fat and, and withholding tax treatment. Now coming to the most important aspect of intra-group services, that is the benefits test. As previously highlighted, the finance team should actually spend up to 90% of their time to determine the benefits that are received by the service recipient from the provision of the, serv the various services, that is, once again, the, glo uh, the global headquarters service, the business platform service, and the regional shared service center service. So for this case, the finance department should ideally, either quarterly or on an annual basis, run checks again to see what are the kind of benefits provided maintain standard audit trails that if ever questioned by the tax authorities, you already have your answers ready. So from this basis, I think benefits test should be the focal point of the finance team. And service catalog, having a standardized service catalog, having standard cost per service already defined, your FTEs and the service departments already identified would really help you do that. Because even after you've prepared a service catalog and you've figured out the exact cost per service, you've figured out who are your ordinarily your service recipients and how to allocate, which allocation key to use, but you really cannot send that invoice and expect it to an intergroup company service invoice to be paid unless a real benefit can be demonstrated to the service recipient. Part of benefits that uh, part of benefit test is also to see whether at the level of the service recipient there's any duplication of those services. Like whether if there is an HR service being provided, does the service recipient also have someone who has the capacity to do the same HR role, to perform the same HR role for which an invoice is being sent? That would even if it follows all your steps of the service catalog that would just not be allowed by the tax authorities of that country because no clear benefit would be seen to that service recipient. It's, uh, just in, uh, as a matter of timing, is there any questions? Uh, do people have questions? Please feel free to share them with us in the, in the chat box. Yeah, chat box um, on, the, on your screen. Um, are, are there any questions for me? Uh, one, but that's uh, more a remark. Someone joins late and is asking if there's a possibility to replay later or download slides. Yes, of course. You will receive a link to download slides as well as the link to the recording of the webinar soon after finalization of the webinar. So PPA has a YouTube channel to uh, to go to and, and rerun any of our webinars uh, for, for those who uh, Joined later. I think uh, uh, also in the light of time, uh, just close, uh, a few closing remarks. I think the takeaways of today is, is uh, we really uh, strongly recommend uh, corporates to standardize um, even to the level of service catalog um, 
invested there in the company services. Right? So the standardization is um, uh, really initiated by the CFOs. And um, I, I'm fully aware that the projects we've worked on, especially if the CFO is on board, uh, do take it away from a pure tax uh, uh, project and do put it in the light of streamlining a finance process. Um, the second takeaway is uh, I always want to know the accountability uh, on the on the capacity risk. So is is the capacity risk uh, accounted for at the level of the service providers? If not, are there other measures the group as a whole takes to keep certain costs under control? Uh, especially uh, my my uh, fun example of of, of nine and a half thousand uh, dollars per per um, per uh, of IT cost per workplace is is a good example where probably some hidden costs of uh, field projects were were included in that charge. Um, I see. A question coming in: Are interviews of service provider acceptable support for benefit tests? Uh, the answer is yes. If from those uh, uh, interviews, the service providers, so almost I would recommend a quarterly or twice a year minimum talk uh, if you're in-house tax with the service provider teams and to get to, to get real examples of what they've been doing. So I call that the project file uh, by the service department, which tells the tells you they have reviewed three commercial contracts for Italy. They've uh, done um, a legal uh, uh, review of uh, uh, of some contracts in Germany. Uh, so it's so a real practical, real tangible, with an order trail to email communication uh, around that. So it's not only the quantification and the allocation keys and the uplift, which a lot of people uh, dwell on, but it's especially um, interviews um, you should focus on to support, uh, to get an order trail around the benefit test. So it's a very good question. So uh, again, uh, take away, standardize your service catalog, uh, define accountability on the capacity risk, especially at the service provider, and then uh, benefit test, as we just addressed that question, benefit test is the most uh, vital element in getting costs deducted. Um, and, and last but not least, that once you standardize and you do everything we were just going through, uh, there's a, a, an enormous drive on projects we run, especially when CFO fully supports it to automate all of the above. So the the data collection from the, the source, uh, the yes or no uplifting according to certain formulas, uh, to auto generation of invoices with predefined specs, where uh, the in house person has a special uh, repository where they can load, upload the results of that interview, that question I was just answering. Um, so the uh, in-house tax person can click on the invoice which was sent to Italy and go all the way back to what the source and activities of that uh, of that service provider was. So I, I think that's that's really the uh, the trend we we see again. CFO driving it uh, makes it a lot easier for tax to to get that organized. Um, um, last question before I think we need to close uh, is from your point of view how difficult it is to get approval uh, of local tax authorities of worldwide policies of centralized charges for the headquarters. Well, the answer is very simple. It's very difficult. Uh, and, and why is it difficult? Because the tax authorities, I give you one example, a couple of examples actually. Uh, the UK HMRC doesn't want to deal with it. They've been very explicit. We only give uh, approvals or we do a review on complex intercompany transactions, and this is perceived to be very not complex, and therefore we, we don't have the capacity to even talk about it 
um, pretty much the same response uh, at the Ministry of Finance here in Holland and, and also in the U.S. Most of the uh, APAs we see passing by are, are dealing with the more complex cases where residual results is being allocated. So, so the minute you move from a cost center to a profit center or an investment center and residual uh, uh, profit needs to be allocated. Uh, all these ministries of finance are very keen. Um, maybe, but I'm not 100% sure. The ICAP, uh, the new, um, uh, the new possibility to to go into eight countries and present them a file on, uh, for example, headquarter cost. Uh, where they need to give a response letter on your position paper, uh, which was an initiative taken uh, by the OECD and eight countries signed up to it, uh, is is a possibility. Again, I th I feel the tax authorities are fairly resistant in in uh, in dealing with headquarter cost and shared service center cost and BU cost. I think also partially because they. They don't see the managerial aspects of these charges. So I think if you can emphasize that, that it goes beyond just an actual charge out of actual cost, but you really are throwing in the managerial layer and the capacity risk being managed by a service provider, it suddenly becomes a profit center uh, on, on the, uh, managing the capacity risk. And I guess then you're closer and more complex and therefore more interesting for tax authorities to talk to. So I think it's it's a it's a natural reaction at this stage. I think uh, the complexity of virtual headquarters, shared service centers, and uh, BUs um, is uh, is exploding in the future. So we we expect that complexity to certainly uh, hit the radar of the tax authorities. Thanks very much to have all of you on this webinar today and wish you a good evening.